This lecture is going to be about uh, unit commitment problems, which is an application of uh, deterministic optimization, specifically linear programming. Um, but it's a special case of linear programming uh, where we have a combination of binary 0, 1 variables and continuous variables. Um, and both of those we use to describe the operations of power plants. So when we're talking about the operation of power plants um, and how we describe those mathematically in an optimization program, um, the first element of that is turning the plant on and off. And, and to do that, we use binary variables. Um, once you turn a plant on, uh, subject to a wide ver uh, variety of, of operating constraints uh, on the plant, um, the amount of electricity that you're producing from an individual power plant we can consider as a continuous variable. Um, and so we need those combination um, to describe the process of turning plants on and off and, and producing at a certain level and tying those variables to information about how much it costs to do that. Uh, and so that uh, ends up being a big part of the objective function that we're trying to, in this case, minimize. So the figure at the bottom here shows um, the, uh, sort of the sort of nature of this, issue, of this problem. Um, most power plants are associated with some sort of minimum generation level, so they don't start at zero and gradually work their way up. Um, usually power plants um, have to be producing several hundred megawatts uh, of electricity uh, in order to actually function. Um, and so the decision to turn a plant on or off we model as, as occurring at their minimum generation level and after that point they can ramp up again subject to, to some constraints. So remember the, the two main parts of any linear program. The first is the objective function. We could be maximizing something or minimizing something. Um, and if you're talking about power plants, um, you know, it's conceivable that you could be doing either. Uh, you could be trying to minimize costs or maximize revenues. And a lot of that decision making um, may uh, depend on what type of market you're operating in and whether a power plant is owned by a big vertically integrated utility like Duke Energy who has a lot of retail customers and they're just trying to provide electricity to meet those customers demands or if it's like a merchant sort of um, not not that Duke's not uh, profit oriented but a merchant power plant would be a, a power plant that's just selling into a wholesale market in other words selling electricity to other utilities and not necessarily trying to meet the demand of customers and they might just be trying to, to maximize revenues. Um, in this case, uh, we're gonna we're gonna just talk about minimizing costs here. So we're gonna assume that the objective function uh, of whatever linear program we're writing here is to minimize the total cost of meeting electricity demand, um, and this would be um, consistent with what a Duke Energy or any, or any other big vertically integrated utility would. Um, would have as an objective function, as well as the objective function of an independent system operator. So remember the ISOs that um, operate wholesale electricity markets, they're not utilities, they're sort of the overseers of, of um, pools of utilities who compete to provide electricity. Um, and so an ISO would also use a, a cost minimization uh, program in order to schedule generation. So what goes in the objective function here? Well, it depends on what you have, what, what's in your portfolio of, of power plants. Um, I, this is a figure we've, we've looked at before in this class, but probably not for a while. Uh, but just as a reminder, and again, this information is a little out of date, I think. Um, but this is a, a picture of where we get our electricity from on average in the United States. Still overwhelmingly dependent on um, thermal generation, so nuclear coal, natural gas. Uh, hydro is about 8%, but it varies year to year. Oil is really small. It's really considered to be the generator of last resort that you only use in, a, in, in extreme circumstances. 
wind is 4%, it's growing, solar I think is 1%, it's growing. Um, so obviously the trends here are a growing portion of this natural gas, shrinking part coal, nuclear staying about the same, might be shrinking a little bit, and, and a lot of the big growth is in wind and solar. Obviously it depends on where you live um, in terms of what portfolio is going to be in place. And a lot of that's tied to geographic differences in resources. Um, if you are in the Mountain West or you're in Appalachia, uh, you're going to use a lot of coal because that's where coal comes from. Uh, if you're on the Gulf Coast, you're going to use a lot of natural gas because you're close to um, refining hubs. Uh, the southeast is uh, dependent a lot on nuclear power because we've traditionally been relatively water rich. Nuclear power takes a lot of water. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, you lose, use you uh, lose, uh, use a lot of hydropower. And if you're in California, uh, you who has basically banned uh, coal-fired power plants because of air quality regulations a long time ago, uh, you're extremely dependent on natural gas and and hydropower. So in our objective function, if we're trying to minimize the cost of meeting electricity demand, the costs are all coming from decisions that we make about how we operate a portfolio of power plants. So decisions about turning generators on and off, that means there's going to be some binary variables involved, and decisions about once we do turn a power plant on, how much electric electricity to produce at an individual power plant, and those are going to involve continuous variables. So a couple um, things to remember here. Um, we cannot control wind and solar. We can't turn wind and solar on and off, and when it's on, we can't change the level of output, right? So we literally cannot represent wind and solar in an objective function to minimize the cost of electricity demand. Um, so we have to represent it some other way, um, and we'll talk about how. Um, a similar, yeah, we have a similar situation with nuclear. Um, you know, nuclear power plants are base load resources, which means we turn them on and we leave them on for long periods of time. But they are operationally so inflexible that um, the decision to turn a power plant on and off, um, you know, we can't represent it the same way we would represent that, that particular decision for a coal plant or a hydroelectric dam. Uh, so for the most part, we don't even represent nuclear power plants in, in the objective functions of, of unit commitment problems. We just assume that they're going to be on all the time, providing you know 95% of their installed capacity in terms of electricity production. So all that's really left here, if we take out variable renewable energy, we take out nuclear, we're really just talking about um, coming up with an optimal way to meet electricity, the rest of electricity demand that's not met by those resources, using fossil fuel thermal plants, so coal, natural gas, and oil, and hydroelectric dams. So there are three main cost components to operating a fossil fuel plant. Uh, once it's been built, so an important um, uh, thing to note here is that we're not talking about the capital costs uh, of investing in, in a power plant or constructing it. So we're not talking about the money that you borrow, whether that's from debt or equity and finance over a long period of time, uh, like a mortgage. So we're not dealing with any of that here. We're just talking about operational costs. And that sort of makes sense because you have to think about the capital costs associated with a power plant as sunk costs. So once you've decided to borrow a lot of money and build a power plant and then pay it off over a long period of time, um, those don't actually factor into how you operate the plant. It might you know, affect decisions about when you retire the plant ultimately, but if you have a plant that's already been constructed, a series of plants that have already been constructed and you're paying the mortgage for them, um, then what you're really focused on is minimizing operational costs. And there are three main components to that. The first is startup costs. So remember, we have AC power systems. And so every power plant that's providing electricity onto the grid has to be operating at 60 hertz. Um, and so for a power plant to go from offline to online and producing electricity at the right frequency takes some time. 
uh, and it really takes fuel. So it, it takes a lot of fuel to ramp a power plant up to the point where it can that it's synchronized, producing electricity at the right frequency. Uh, and so there's significant costs associated with that process. The other important component is fixed costs. Um, and so fixed costs are sort of a, um, a jumbled um, pot of a bunch of different costs um, that a power plant operator would have to pay uh, regardless of how much generation is actually being produced. So as long as a power plant is online, there's a certain bundle of costs that it's going to incur. And it could be, I mean, the way to think about this is, you know, people's salary potentially, um, you know, keeping the lights on, um, O&M potentially, you know, just wear and tear as a result of the plant being online. And, you know, we've talked about um, failure rates and how to model failure rates uh, for power plants. And a certain amount of that, you know, there's a probability distribution about how often a plant will fail. Um, but it's sort of inevitable that, you know, if you run a power plant for a certain number of hours, something will go wrong and you have to pay some money to fix it. And so that's all included here uh, in fixed costs. Then the third one is variable costs. And these are costs that accrue for the plant operator uh, proportional or proportionally um, with how much electricity is actually being produced. So for each power plant in our system, we have these three different cost components, start costs, fixed costs, and variable costs. And so remember, we're, the objective function of this you know, big optimization, the unit commitment problem, is to minimize cost. And so we have to be able to represent those three cost components for each power plant in the objective function. And to do that, we have to define these decision variables. The first one is a start variable. And so this is going to be a binary zero one variable where one indicates that in a certain period, the plant has been started. Uh, an on variable, we're going to say, is also a binary variable. And if the on variable equals one for a given period, that indicates that the plant is online. And so there, we're making a distinction here between start and on, where start indicates that the plant has in that period been started, and a, an on indicates that the plant is online and potentially might have been started several periods ago. Generation, or gen here, is a continuous variable, so not a binary variable. So it can take any value within some sort of uh, bound, right? Uh, it's obviously not going to be zero. We move, well, in some cases it could be, but a lot of plants have minimum generation requirements. So it's going to be some low number up to the maximum generating capacity of the power plant. So if we're trying to minimize, well, let's start with an easy example. Let's say our objective function is not necessarily to meet electricity demand per se, given a whole portfolio of power plants. Let's just look at one power plant. So our objective function at first is just to minimize the cost of producing electricity at one power plant. So there's three components to that, the start costs, fixed costs, and variable costs. So the start, again, is a zero one variable, on is a zero one variable, and, and the variable cost, or uh, gen, so the amount of actual electricity that's produced is a uh, continuous variable. Uh, and then we have three coefficients here. So A would be the start cost, associated with a plant start. So we, we can define that in dollars per event or dollars per, you know, switching from off to on. Uh, the fixed costs are, uh, associate, are, are calculated by multiplying the on variable times a B coefficient, which is a dollar per hour amount. So it's just this fixed dollar value that we have to pay every hour that the power plant's on regardless of how much electricity is actually being produced. And then variable costs we represent by multiplying the gen variable, which is a, the actual amount of electricity that we're producing, times the, the variable cost rate of, of producing electricity at the plant, so in dollars per megawatt hour. So in this case, uh, we are assuming, the way I've written it, um, that uh, the variable costs uh, for this particular power plant, we can, we can calculate by multiplying this continuous variable gen uh, 
times the variable cost rate C, which I gave you in a dollar per megawatt hour amount. Now, this is what we're assuming here is that we can accurately represent the variable cost of a, of a power plant using a constant marginal cost, right? So that every, what this is basically saying is that every individual unit of electricity that we produce as we go from, for example, 200 megawatt hours um, up to uh, 1,000 megawatt hours, each individual unit of electricity we produce as we increase production costs us the same, right? And so that's probably not a good assumption, and we might have to adjust how we model this. And so let's talk a little bit more about that. And it has to do with the mechanics of power plants. So you all may be sort of familiar with the idea that cars um, reach their, uh, you know, maximum fuel efficiency, so you get the most miles per gallon um, at a certain speed, right? And I think it's like 55 miles per, you know, miles per hour or something like that. And historically, uh, that has some importance um, in how speed limits were set in the United States. If you, I don't know if you guys remember, um, or at least remember reading about this, uh, but during uh, the, the late 70s, uh, during one of the, the oil crises, it became policy in terms of um, setting uh, speed limits on highways uh, to actually lower the, uh, the speed limit from 65 to 55 miles per hour in order to make cars more fuel efficient, to reduce demand for gasoline. Uh, and so power plants are kind of similar. There's a there's a point at which, uh, you know, if you're if you're operating really slowly, you know, same as a car. If you're driving really slowly, your car is less efficient, um, and it increases in efficiency up to a certain point, and then the efficiency decreases. Uh, and power plants are the exact same way. And so if we're talking about the fuel efficiency of a power plant, we use the phrase heat rate, and the heat rate just means the amount of fuel in million BTUs required per megawatt hour of electricity that's produced. Um, and so this figure in the middle shows the relationship between heat rate and the actual level of production produced um, at a power plant. And you can see that uh, you know it starts out the heat rate's really high and then you, as you increase production heat rate declines, right? And so a lower heat rate means we need less fuel per megawatt hour, so the efficiency of the plant increases. And up until a certain point where we reach this minimum point on the heat rate curve, and then it starts to increase. Uh, and this happens because as um, you're increasing, you know, production of electricity, uh, the temperature increases. And as the temperature increases, you're losing more of that energy that you're getting from the fuel as heat. Uh, and so that's the main source of uh, inefficiency for power plants is you're, you're only converting a fraction of this electricity um, or the embedded fuel or embedded energy in the fuel into electricity and the rest you're losing as heat and as, as, as you increase the production of electricity at power plants beyond a certain point uh, you're losing more of that embedded energy in the fuel uh, to heat loss. Um, and so the total variable cost of a power plant uh, for any given level of production can be calculated with this equation at the bottom where you have cost in dollars is equal to the heat rate. And remember, the heat rate is a function of the amount of generation you're producing. So the first and the last term here in this equation are connected where the amount of generation you're producing feeds back and actually dictates what the heat rate's going to be. So the heat, you have the heat rate in million BTUs time, uh, over uh, megawatt hours times the fuel price, and generally when we talk about fuel price, we're always going to talk about it in dollars per million BTUs because that's a way to standardize uh, a dollar per heat content um, value for any type of fuel. It allows us to compare the cost of you know, coal and natural gas and oil, uh, all in, in terms of the same energy content. So we're multiplying heat rate times fuel price times generation, and so all the units uh, cancel out here to give you um, uh, just a dollar value. So because we are dealing with um, systems where the, the efficiency of the power plant and the heat rate of the power plant uh, 
changes as a function of the level of production. Um, the cost function itself is not linear, right? So we can't actually assume a constant marginal cost for many thermal different types of thermal power plants, uh, at least fossil fuel uh, power plants um, that are being, uh, you know, with nuclear power plants, you know, I, th I think the same is probably true. However, what we know about nuclear power plants, well, number one, we're not going to include them in the unit commitment problem because of their operational flexibility, but also, um, and probably for the same reason, um, we know that they're basically operating at the same level of production all the time. And if that's the case, and you're not going, you know, producing more power from a nuclear power plant in one hour and, and uh, less the next, then we don't really have to worry about where we on where we are on the efficiency curve. But fossil fuel power plants like coal and, and and natural gas power plants do vary their level of production on an hourly basis uh, in order to accommodate uh, constantly changing electricity demand. So we do have to take into account um, them, you know, their ability to, to increase and decrease production on an hourly basis and how that translates to number one changes in heat rate and then also how that uh, translates to uh, changes in the marginal cost of producing electricity and so we have to use a nonlinear cost curve and so this should look a little bit familiar from our discussion of deterministic optimization and linear programming uh, using of, of nonlinear uh, functions right so we, we can't just uh, incorporate this nonlinear function. Although this is close to, to being linear, uh, it's not quite. So we, we can't just incorporate this into a linear program. We have to break this function up into four piecewise uh, linear functions. So we describe um, four different marginal costs of electricity production for this individual power plant depending on how much electricity it's producing. So if it's in the red zone here, if it's producing not much electricity, um, it has uh, a lower marginal cost here. If it, uh, and then you can see that as the um, level of production increases, the marginal cost or the slope of this, of this function starts to increase. So if you're in the green zone, uh, the marginal cost or the slope here is, is higher than in the red zone blue is higher than green and gold is, is slightly higher than blue here although I would say you know three and four look pretty similar um, but still important to take into account so by incorporating the nonlinear aspects of the cost function here we have to amend the objective function so we're no longer just assuming that we can represent the objective function and in particular the variable cost of the power plant using this continuous variable gen times this constant rate constant dollar per megawatt hour rate C. We have to replace the C part and the gen part with this piecewise representation of the cost function. So now we have minimizing the cost of start times A plus on times B uh, and now we have all this other stuff. So we have x1 times c1, x2 times c2, x3 times c3, and x4 times c4. So x1, x2, x3, and x4 are the amount of generation produced in each of those individual segments that we formed by breaking up the nonlinear cost curve. Um, and remember, since we're minimizing the cost here, that's, that's why we can do this, right? Um, if we were trying to maximize um, the, the, this function, this cost function, we would not be able to as easily incorporate this into a linear program without a, a lot of additional constraints. The reason why it works for a minimization problem is because if we are trying to minimize the cost, by default, the, the power plant will start producing in the red zone because the marginal cost is lower and then it will move to the green zone, and then it will move to the blue zone. If we are maximizing, uh, if we were maximizing this function, it would start with x4, right? Because it has a, a higher marginal, you know, uh, value associated with it. And that would be sort of um, nonsensical because we know that you can't start producing, you know, a really high amount of energy. You have to sort of work your way up. Um, 
so the constraints here we don't have to actually constrain um, this you know uh, any sort of uh, we don't have to put in specifically in the problem you know you have to start with x1 and only when you've exhausted the amount of production in x1 can you move on to x2 because we're minimizing the cost the objective function does that for us anyway but we do have to have constraints here on the size of x1, x2, x3, and x4. These are all continuous variables, but they have to be between 0 and L1, L2, L3, and L4. And remember, if you go back to the previous slide, L1, L2, L3, and L4 were the respective widths of all of those piece, the, the broken out piecewise, pieces of the, of the nonlinear function. We're also saying that the, we're keeping the value or the, the variable gen. Um, but gen we define here as the sum of x1, x2, x3, and x4. So we can um, do something similar for accommodating um, the incorporation of multiple time periods here. So we not we don't not only want to um, go from uh, you know, the the simple objective function that I've listed up at the top to one in which we're incorporating a portfolio of generators, but also one in which we're incorporating multiple time periods because um, there are, you know there are a number of reasons why you want to think about what's going to potentially happen in the future um, you know while you're making a decision in the current moment in the current hour about what plants you're using to potentially and how much of each plant you're using to meet electricity demand um, and so typically system operators whether that's a vertically integrated utility like Duke Energy or an ISO will look up to a week in advance um, or out into the future when they're making decisions about meeting demand in the current moment. Um, and so the way we do this, um, we're, we're adding as part of the cost minimization, not only are we summing over every generator in the portfolio, we're also summing over every time period in what we would call the planning horizon. And so you could think about this as... Um, you know, really drawing a line in the sand about how much future information you want to incorporate into your decision making about how you use plants right now. Um, and so I've listed here 168 hours or, or one week is pretty common. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you're making a decision about what you're going to do in the 168th hour right now. All it means is you're incorporating that in a guess about what, what the, the world's going to look like in 168 hours, like what demand's going to be, you know, what plants you're going to have online or offline. Um, and and that, a lot of that's going to be forecast-based, right, so probabilistic. Um, but you're incorporating that information to the best of your ability uh, in the process. And the only information that you're really keeping when all is said and done is is the decision you make about what you do right now um, and then you know as you get closer to you know 168 hours into the future um, that information is going to get better because you're going to be fewer days out and uh, the forecasts are going to be more accurate um, so this is just an attempt to incorporate as much information as was reasonably possible um, into the decision making process and so we're adding subscripts on our decision variables but not our parameters here um, we're adding t subscripts subscripts for the start on and all the x's so we're not adding t's onto a b or the c's because those are uh, characteristics of the power plants themselves right so a is the the dollar value per start B is the dollar per hour fixed cost and all the C's are the slopes of that piecewise variable cost function or the the slopes of the the piecewise cost function so they represent the marginal cost associated with different zones of the cost function uh, and so all of those are specific to a J value, uh, a particular generator in the portfolio, uh, 
but they don't vary through time. At least we're going to assume that they don't vary through time. Uh, and so the only thing we're adding T's onto are the decisions we make about, you know, are we starting the plant in period T? Is it on in period T? And how much uh, of each zone of the nonlinear cost function, each X, are we going to produce in period T? So we use this, you know, this objective function is looking, for example, 168 hours into the future. Um, we're scheduling things, you know, looking, the planning horizon is 168 hours, so seven days. And so what I want to do here is sort of illustrate how that becomes part of this day-to-day -day process of scheduling generation. So if we're in day one right now, we're looking you know, potentially six days into the future, incorporating information on days two through seven about what we do in day one, all we're keeping from that, that, you know, if we solve this linear program looking seven days at a time, we're going to get a solution that is the, the minimum, the, the least cost way of meeting electricity demand for days one through seven. And what we're really solving for are the values for all our decision variables. So all the start variables in every hour of every day, one through seven for every generator, all the on variables and all the X variables. All we're keeping though, once we solve that problem for seven days, is what we got for, for day one. We don't, we don't actually care, you know, if we, if we solve the problem initially, we, the answers that we get about, you know, the least cost of way of, of meeting electricity demand for, for day two, we're, we're going to solve that in day two when we have a little better information about what electricity demand is. So all we're keeping, we're keeping the information of the first day for each problem, and then the rest we sort of toss out, and then we just run the problem again, but shifted 24 hours into the future. And so that's what this is supposed to show here, is you solve seven days at a time, keep the information you, you got from the solution of the problem for day one, and then you shift seven days into the future, you keep information for day two, and then you sh shift 24 hours into the future, etc. So we have to add uh, a number of other constraints to this problem. Uh, the, the objective function looks pretty good here, and we've, we've found a way by subscripting a lot of the, all the decision variables and some of the operating parameters uh, to expand this from just talking about one generator in one time period to a portfolio of generators for multiple time periods over our planning horizon. Um, we also have to make sure that there are, you know, specific constraints in place that make sure our model doesn't do weird stuff. Uh, and so the first one is we have to make sure all the values of gen, remember for each individual power plant, all the X's add up to equal gen, right? And so what we have to make sure is that uh, the amount, total amount of generation for each power plant in every single, in every single period is less than or equal to the maximum plant capacity. And so that's what this initial constraint shows, um, that the generation in for, for, port, for generator J in period T has to be less than or equal to the maximum installed capacity for that particular generator. And we're multiplying it here times the on switch, or the, the on variable, which remember is this binary variable where it's, if it's one, if it's on, and it's zero it's a, if it's off. Now the reason we write this constraint uh, is in order to for part, there's two sort of reasons we have this particular constraint written this way. The first is to make sure that gen is always less than or equal to um, max j. The other reason is we need some way to, in our objective function, make sure that, you know, there's, there's sort of this precondition that if we have, uh, if x1, uh, you know, is, is greater than zero, uh, then we have to have, then 
the on variable has to equal one, right? So that means what, in other words, if the power plant is producing any amount of electricity at all, then the on variable has to equal one. Um, we will want to make sure that there is sort of like internally consistent communication between the start on and all the X's. Um, and so the way this constraint is written is it's written in a way such that if gen is greater than zero, which can only happen if one of the X's is greater than zero, then the only way for this inequality to be true um, is if the on switch uh, is is greater than zero as well because if gen was greater than zero if, like for example if the if the power plant was producing 10 megawatts total then gen equals 10 right and so gen e 10 is only less than or equal to the maximum capacity times on if on is one if on is zero then this inequality reads 10 is less than or equal to zero, which is false, right? So because we have this constraint in place, any time any power plant is producing any electricity at all, this constraint forces on equal to be uh, the, the value of one, in addition to constraining the value of gen to be less than or equal to the maximum capacity of the plant. So, uh, in a similar way, we have to connect the on and start variables. So in, on the previous slide, we talked about how we had to make sure that any time one of the x's was greater than zero and gen was greater than zero, we had to make sure that that triggered uh, through a, the, writing a constraint uh, a, a one value for the on variable. And so we also have to make sure that any time we see some combination of um, on variables that suggests that in the previous time period a plant was off and in the current period it's on, we, we want that to trigger a, a one value for the start variable as well. So there are four different combinations of on variables when you're talking about the, uh, you know, the combination of um, on variable values for the previous time period in T minus one and the current time period in, in period T. And I've outlined those um, uh, at the at the bottom in this two by two matrix. Now the numbers in the uh, in the matrix uh, cells are the values of what's on the right hand side of this equality of the or inequality, this constraint at the top. Uh, and so what it's saying is that um, the the right hand side of this equation minus on j t minus 1 plus on j t um, equals 0 whenever uh, there's no change, right? So if the previous time period was on equal 1 and in the current time period on equals 1, um, then the right-hand side of this inequality is equal to 0. Same thing if the last time period the plant was off and the current time period the plant's off. But if the last time period the plant was off, so on t minus 1 equals 0, and the current time period on t equals 1, the value of this on the right-hand side of this equality uh, is equal to 1. And so for the, on the only way for that inequality to hold, if the right-hand side of the inequality is equal to 1, then the left-hand side start has to be uh, 1 as well. Remember, start is a binary variable. And so this the way we've written it effectively makes sure that start is um, going to be 1 whenever on t minus 1 equals 0 and on t equals 1. Now in the case where uh, the right hand side of the inequality is um, equal to negative 1, so if in the time previous time period um, you know, the plant was on and in the current time period it's off, the right-hand side of the inequality is equal to minus one, but that's okay because uh, for, for start, that doesn't imply any particular value about the start variable, which has to be zero or one, which are both greater than negative one. So if we put these two new constraints together,
Um, what it effectively does is it links all of our decision variables in a way that um, the, the value of the x's determines what the value of the ons are, and the value of the ons de determines what the value of the starts are, right? So we have an internally co like you know consistent way of modeling the behavior of the plant that, that translates accurately to particular values in our decision variables, which ultimately we're trying to minimize, right? Uh, and so that makes sure nothing wacky happens where in terms of the X's, it looks like the plants are turning on and off, but that's not reflected somehow in our other decision variables, the start and the on. So uh, lots of other constraints exist here. Um, the primary one, of course, is meeting electricity demand. Uh, we haven't really talked about that. That's sort of been implicit in how we set this problem up. But of course, we want the cumulative sum of all the X's for all the different generators in our portfolio. So remember, the gen uh, var variable for each uh, individual generator is equal to the sum of all the X's. That has, you know, cumulatively, for the whole portfolio, portfolio from J equals 1 to capital J, it has to be greater than or equal to the demand that we're experiencing in each hour, right? And we're going to subtract here from the demand we need, the total electricity demand for the system, we're going to subtract from that the amount of wind that's available, the amount of solar that's available, and the amount of nuclear that's available. We talked at the beginning about how these are not really incorporated into a unit commitment or economic dispatch model because we can't control you know when we're producing electricity from these units you know, mostly I mean, you certainly can do something about it um, but not in the same sense that we're going to you know, think about you know controlling the level of generation from from for example a, a fossil fuel power plant or a hydroelectric dam We also need to make sure that power plants are not producing close to zero. Uh, you know, as I, m I mentioned a couple times, that many fossil fuel power plants have minimum generating capacity. Um, you know, these are due to safety, design limitations, economic reasons, combination of all of these. Uh, so each power plant J is associated with a parameter that's minimum gen generating capacity. Um, that has to be met before it starts producing electricity. Um, and so we're going to set the constraint here similar to the way we set the maximum generating capacity constraint um, so that uh, if on is equal to 1, um, whether, you know, because the value of gen is greater than or equal to 1, uh, this constraint forces gen to be at least as large as the plant minimum generation, right? So if we know that uh, I or on is equal to one, because you know we're producing some amount of electricity, the only way for this inequality to be accurate is if the left-hand side of the equation, gen, is greater than or equal to the minimum generating capacity. Now, if on is equal to zero, then there's no real constraint here, right? Because the, the right-hand side of the equation is zero and there's no constraint on what the value of gen is. We also have um, specific constraints on thermal power plants about the minimum number of hours that a plant must re remain online if it's started. Um, and these constraints are in place, they're part of the you know mechanical design limitations of power plants, but also they're there for or economic reasons, um, and so we can define this minimum number, um, at, uh, and it could be hours or days even, as up, and we can design a constraint um, here based purely on the. Um, on the value, the you know the the relationship between different on variables um, that forces um, 
uh, on variables to be you know consecutive. If a power plant gets turned on in one hour, it this this relationship between on variables here forces a number of consecutive on variables to also be one um, in order to maintain this minimum uptime requirement. Uh, and this is, you know, this slide is just sort of me proving it to you um, that, that the actual math here works. Um, and, you know, feel free to go through this. This is basically looking at different combinations of um, on values and time periods uh, for a specific power plant that has a minimum uptime of, of three hours. Um, and, you know, you can, you can go through and make, you know, convince yourself that this works. Um, but I'm not going to go through it here and explain it. So a similar constraint is in place to make sure that plants adhere to minimum downtimes. And so you need this because you know if you're if you're turning off a really big thermal power plant, uh, you can't just turn it right back on again, right? There may be some requirement that the plant has to be stay has to stay offline in order to do you know. Uh, operations and, and or maintenance regular you know regular maintenance that, that follows any time a, a plant is shut offline uh, or there may, might be you know you know design limitations about uh, how quickly a plant can can ramp right back up into production um, and so all of these again the minimum downtime would be pre-specified for a certain type of power plant you would input this in uh, and as a sort of a similar feel in terms of the logic um, to the minimum uptime requirement and you know you can feel free to, to try out this math and make sure it works. We also need ramp rates. These are um, uh, very important design limitations on the flexibility of power plants to change output or the level of, of electricity production on an hour to hour basis. When we talk about peaking plants versus baseload power plants, a lot of that has to do with con um, constraints on ramp rates. Right? Peaking plants are ones that have very high ramp rates where we can go, we can turn a power plant on and basically go from you know, zero to 100% production, uh, not instantaneously, but within an hour, right? in a couple of minutes. Examples would be uh, combustion, natural gas turbines, hydroelectric dams, um, we need power plants that can do this, that have very high ramp rates. Other types of power plants uh, may be way less flexible, like coal-fired power plants, and have very low ramp rates, which means they're much more constrained in their ability to change um, the level of electricity production uh, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. And we build into the linear program here uh, specific constraints. And so what we're saying here is that the difference in generation uh, total generation for a power plant, any given power plant J, in time period T and t time period T minus 1 has to be less than or equal to the ramp rate. And we also set a, a constraint where the left-hand side of the inequality is, is switched, right? So we, it doesn't matter if we're ramping up or we're ramping down. That difference, that period-to-period -period difference, has to be less than or equal to the specific ramp rate for a given power plant. One of the other things that we have to make sure we're providing in, in addition to demand is reserves, right? So we've talked a lot about um, in the lecture on uh, shocks and failures, the need to have redundancy built into systems. Um, and we've talked a little bit about uh, what reserve margins are, right? So we have to have extra capacity built into um, power systems beyond, um, you know, just the, the forecasted peak annual demand, right? If, you know, if we think the highest electricity demand that Duke Energy ever experiences in the western half of the state is, you know, 18,000 megawatts, there's a reason that their entire generating capacity is 23, uh, 23,000 megawatts. It's because you know, they want to make sure that if a power plant fails, there's something online um, 
or can rapidly become online in order to respond to that contingency. And so reserves are a very specific way of saying in every hour that that extra capacity actually exists, that it's online and that the right types of power plants are off or it doesn't have to be online, um, but the right types of power plants are, are there that are not necessarily being used to produce, produce electricity um, that, that could respond quickly in the event that, you know, there's a grid failure, you know, whether it's a power plant that goes down or, or a transmission line disconnects um, some power plant from the rest of the grid. So we're going to define reserves here as R J T, right? So this is the amount of reserves, not electricity, the amount of reserves that are provided by generator J in period T. For the system as a whole, we have some amount of reserves that are, are going to be required. And I think we've talked about it before. Um, you know, there are a couple of ways to, to figure out exactly how much reserves should be available in each hour. A common rule of thumb not a particularly conservative one, um, but a common rule of thumb is that is, is what we call an N minus one criterion, and what that means is that we have to have enough reserves available to cover the largest contingency on the system. So the largest single power plant that could fail and go offline, you have to have at least that much reserves um, allocated. And so here we're summing again over every generator in the system, every portfolio, every generator in the portfolio. So we're saying that the amount of reserves provided, you know, from little j equals 1 all the way up to capital J um, in time period T has to be greater than or equal to the amount of reserves demanded, uh, which we could say is an N minus 1 criteria or something else, for every single hour that we're going to model. We also have to make sure that uh, when we are scheduling generation at individual uh, power plants, that we are considering the fact that that power plant may need to be used to provide reserves, right? So there's a zero-sum game here. You can't, um, you know, produce electricity at a power plant uh, at its maximum capacity and then also use that same power plant to provide reserves. So the total amount of generate actual generation and reserves provided by a power plant has to uh, be less than or equal to its maximum capacity for every hour for every power plant. So I, th I think this might be the last slide. This is in general how you set up a unit commitment problem. We'll go through some of the details in class and maybe solve one and, and take a look at some of the output. Actually, there should be another slide. This is the last slide. So if you have, you know, our objective function in place, you have all these different constraints. Um, and then what's what the only thing that you have really left to solve um, or input into the model is some sort of time series, right, of electricity demand. So, and you could, you know, I think you should be able to think back and, and about all the different things, the, the time series methods we went through in class, the different types of time series modeling we've done. Um, and we're, what we're really trying to do is come up with a time series of electricity demand on an hourly basis, right? And that could be, you could have a time series of historical electricity demand. If you just want to look at, you know, the behavior of a power system, you know, as it went through an actual event that really happened. But if you're trying to think about how a system might behave in the future, uh, under stress or under, you know, different uh, change, you know, changes in different ec economic drivers like fuel prices or, or, or stuff like that, or changes in the availability of variable renewable energy like wind and solar, uh, you may want to just use some of the time series modeling approaches that we use, whether it's ARMA models um, or anything else like that, in order to come up with a synthetic time series of electricity demand which you would input uh, into the model and you know the model would take 168 hours of that at a time and solve it right it would come up with a generating schedule which is visualized here right and so all that means is uh, 
you have this time series of electricity demand and this looks kind of like electricity demand in the summertime where you have one peak during the day and then what the the model output is um, is a series of ones and zeros right for the start and the on variables and then uh, values and for all your X's right so it's telling you whether power plants are online <clears throat> and if they are online how much electricity they're producing and uh, you know what we've because we've constrained the output of this model and the values that we put on all these decision variables um, to specifically meet electricity demand in every hour if you add up all the gens right if you add up all the X's and all the gens uh, for every power plant in the system, uh, the cumulative production across all those generators is going to equal electricity demand, right? So that is a constraint on the solution of this problem is that at the very least, this is going to output um, a way for us to meet electricity demand. But our objective function is specifically minimizing the cost of doing that. So what you get is the, is the what you should do to minimize cost the, the cost of meeting electricity demand in every hour of every day. Uh, and so what, in this case, the model gives us is something that we've seen before, right? So nuclear power stays on pretty much all the time. Coal is also used as base load. Uh, and natural gas and, and hydropower are used mostly as, as peaking power plants. All right, so this is the last slide. Um, I'll post this on YouTube now, and we will go through some of this stuff in more detail on Tuesday.